Jocko Willink, currently number one on the lo-fi charts, Terrence McKenna, and Alan Watts. Welcome to the Jordan B. Peterson podcast. Dad, why did you want to talk with Akira? Well, I've been following the work that Akira has been doing for about a year. I, I think you introduced him to me, actually. I found out about him somehow on YouTube, and he was this interesting and idiosyncratic person who was producing music of a genre that I wasn't familiar with that mixed spoken word with, well, with background music. And, and it, it was, it's like a version of hip hop, although a very calm version, I would say. And he sent it to me, or I stumbled across it, and I kind of kept an eye on it because I was interested to see if people would respond to that combination of spoken word, say, from my lectures and music. And he seemed to be serious about what he was doing, and he seemed to be doing a good job. And so I've been following for about a year, and he seems to be coming more popular by all appearances. So I thought it was a good time to talk to him, to find out what he's up to. He just released something called 42 Rules for Life. He'd asked me for an audio an audio recording of all the 42 rules that I had written originally for Quora, from which my book, 12 Rules from Life, and the next book as well, have been derived. And so that was another reason why it was a good time to talk to him, because he just released that this week, and I thought it had gone pretty well. You know, and he's a peculiar and interesting person, and so it's always entertaining to talk to someone who's creative and original in a way that you wouldn't expect. Peculiar how? Like super open? Yeah, he's that's right. And 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 you know, he's he's trying to make a living doing something that no one else is making a living at. And um he's getting enough downloads on Spotify and other uh what other venues for distribution of music to to continue with his work. When we return, Dad's conversation with DJ Akira the Dawn. Hey guys, an update on upcoming events. Dad is going to be debating Slavoj Žižek April 19th at 7.30 p.m. EST in Toronto. The debate is Marxism versus capitalism and should be very interesting. Žižek is basically the world's most prominent Marxist and Dad thinks Marxism is pretty much the most dangerous ideology out there. Should be spicy. Tickets are completely sold out. They sold out incredibly fast. So we set up a live stream for the first time. We figured people who weren't in Toronto would want a chance to see the debate. Plus, a lot of Zizek's fans are European. Tickets are being sold at Dad's website, jordanbpeterson.com slash events, and at petersonversuszizek.com. It should be extremely interesting. Akira the Dawn is a British musician, DJ, and producer. He's worked in genres as diverse as pop, hip-hop, indie, dance, and more recently, perhaps, something that has come to be known as lo-fi. For reasons that have been quite surprising to me, Akira has been making lo-fi tracks, also known as Meaning Wave, a combination of metered spoken word and music chosen for its emotional and conceptual appropriateness, from some of my sayings and my talks, they have been reasonably well listened to, garnering maybe a million views over the 10 or 15 or so that he has posted on YouTube. The two main albums, 12 Rules for Life and JBP Wave Genesis, have elicited more than a million streams each on Spotify. And that doesn't include iTunes and other content providers of the same type. The third album, oriented around my words, will be entitled JBP Wave Paradise. It will be released a week today. Earlier this week, Akira also released a long single, 42 Rules for Life, based on the totality of the rules I had written for Quora several years ago. I think I'll feature that on today's podcast. Akira has also produced similar works, featuring Ellen Watts, Jocko Willink, who is currently number one in the Meaning Wave charts, Terence McKenna, David Foster Wallace and Elon Musk, among others. Overall, Spotify downloads have topped 4 million, and he's experiencing an approximate exposure at the moment of about a million a month. So, welcome, Akira. It's nice to talk to you. We've met a little bit before, not, not a lot, as I became aware of what you were doing. 
this is the first time really that we'll have a chance to talk in any great detail. Yes, we've emailed. So, so what are you up to, bluntly? Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm engaged in an experiment in uh, ridiculous hyperproductivity and uh, zone inhabitation. Uh, my idea being, well, basically, you know, I'm, I'm working on this music. But aside from working on the music, I'm working on remaining in the zone of making music so the music uh, flows and becomes better and better and better. And my whole process becomes more efficient and powerful with each thing. So it's this combined thing of, of making this, this new form of music or this, nothing's new, is it? Making this form of music and doing it in a hyperproductive and powerful fashion. Okay, so let's start with hyperproductive. So because you said you had twin ambitions. And so what's the hyperproductive element? Well, I've released, is it five albums this year so far? four or five albums this year so far. We're in March. It's March oh, 2019. So you, you mean s since the beginning of 2019? Indeed. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, that, that seems to qualify as hyperproductive, especially yeah. if this also happens to be a difficult endeavor. It is. It is. But here's the thing I, I noticed. Uh, I used to be a music journalist, and there's this phenomenon wherein bands' first albums are amazing, and uh, then their second albums are often not amazing. And there are a bunch of reasons for this, but I, I figured the main thing is a band will be locked in a garage playing together every day for years and years and years, and writing songs together and so on and so forth. And their first album will be the sum of that. They'll have uh, essentially been in a kind of flow, and the first album will be the fruits of that flow. And then the record company usually sends them on tour for a couple of years, at which point they fall out of that flow of writing songs all the time. And uh, when they go back into the studio, they've sort of fallen out of that zone. So I wondered to myself, what would happen if one got in the zone and then refused to leave? Hmm. If one just got in the state of just constantly creating uh, with a very specific sort of mission and purpose and, uh, and found out foundational sort of meaning behind it so one doesn't get discouraged or whatever and uh just kept doing that what would happen and uh, i've been doing that since last february and uh the results have been beyond what i could have uh hoped for hmm. and okay the results being beyond what you could have hoped for along what dimensions what's what's changed for you over the last couple of years like what's this what, what was your career like before you did this? And what's changed as a consequence for you in your career? And, well, let's also say personally. Ooh, a lot. I mean, uh, previously, I mean, I've been doing this, uh, you know, as, as sort of my job uh, since 2004, full time. Around 2000, 2004, I got my first record deal, with, uh, which was with Interscope Records in America after a bizarre sequence of events. Um, and yeah, I've been making music full-time ever since and DJing. Uh, however, previously, if you kind of look at my catalog, you know, there would be many, many years between releases. And uh, the old model of the music industry, which I was, I was sort of trapped in, um, which was completely my own fault, because I'd, I'd yet to, to imagine oh, another way fully. Um, you know, you spend years making an album is the idea. And then you spend years promoting it or a long time promoting it. And it's all about getting press and all these sorts of things. And um, I would get sort of discouraged and sad if I would spend, I'd spend a lot of time making a thing. And then I would go to sort of put it out and I wouldn't have all the resources that I felt that I wanted or needed to get it to all the people that it should get to. Um, which is kind of the old model. Whereas now what I'm, do what I'm doing, part of what's going on now is I'm just kind of releasing a vast amount of stuff at a very, very high level. And uh, it sort of compounds. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the time is different in the internet. A week yes. is a long time in the internet. A week is a very, very long time. So these days I make sure some new music comes out every week. And uh, Yes, well, the internet uh, radically accelerates the production schedule of everything. I mean, yeah. look, we're going to make this video and... Hypothetically, I could release it this afternoon, 
Yeah. Which is a crazy thing to do with a, <laughs> well, with a, with a, what's essentially a semi documentary. I mean, <laughs> unheard of, you know. I know. Look at your camera quality. Hmm. It's amazing. You know, we're all walking around with, uh, with devices in our pockets that are better than the things they made uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and Incredible it's thing. a very, and the, the consequence of that speed acceleration is very um, psychologically dramatic as well, because it also becomes something that you have to feed on a very regular basis, like oh, the yes. plant in Little Shop of Horrors. Yes, exactly. The algorithms are hungry. Mm -hmm. and yeah, they, and they will punish you if they're not fed. But uh, yeah, they punish you by having the fruits of your previous work start to decline. Indeed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, what was that thing? Alan Moore had that thing. You talked about steam theory, which was the idea that uh, the amount of time between the first human, in say, the uh, the invention of the the stone axe, and then uh, the baths of Rome. And then the amount of time it takes to create the same amount of stuff. You get to the point where between 1960 and 1970, human information doubles. Yes, everything's uh, doubling at an incredibly rapid yes. rate. Yeah. Exactly. So his, his idea, and I think this was in sort of the early 2000s, he was talking about how by around 2013, we would go from a fluid culture of this sort of like river of information and creation to so much stuff being generated at any one moment uh, that you go from fluid to steam. Uh, and then, was, and then, was that Kurtz, was that Kurtzweil's um, uh, an, an analogy? Who's, who, who mentioned that? I heard Alan Moore talk about that. You heard Alan that? Moore. Okay, because Kurtzweil, Kurtzweil is, of course, famous for the idea that the singularity is coming as a consequence of all of this doubling. Yeah, it's a, it's, I guess it's a similar thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. The idea is that, you know, once you're in steam territory... Anything could happen at any given second. There's things being birthed. Like right now, someone could be about to put something in the app store that fundamentally changes the way we interact and, and do stuff. Well, yes, happens. yes. Well, that seems to be happening on a very regular basis. I think it's happening so rapidly that we don't even notice it. You yeah. know, I think, um, what's that dating app that you swipe <laughs> Tinder. Tinder. Tinder's Tinder. a good example of that because Tinder was yes. a revolutionary technology, but it was buried by so many other revolutionary technologies that nobody even noticed that it was a revolutionary technology. Yes. You know, so, and I think this is happening. It's happening so quickly that it's impossible to even keep track of. I mean, I work with a young team of programmers, and, you know, they're always looking on the net for new tools to help accelerate what they're capable of doing. And, you know, the, the library of tools out there is, well, if it's not infinite, it's at least unsearchable. And that also means that each programmer or each expert can have a whole domain of tools that he or she is the only person who knows anything about, which is also yes. very peculiar. This has happened with everything. It's happened with music. There's so much like music. Uh, it used to be that if you wanted to make a, a record, you would have to go to a studio. And only a few people really got to go to studios because they were very expensive and there weren't even that many of them. So it was only a few people got to make music at a high level. Just a few de a decade, a few de a decade ago, a decade and a half ago. Yeah. Whereas now, the thing I'm talking to you on is the same thing that creates most of the music you'll hear on the radio. And then within that, there's this infinity of tools and ways of, of creating and manipulating sound uh, that each person who does it has a unique, unique stack of things that they use that's unique to them. Right. Well, the strange yeah. thing about what's happened with you, I would say, or one of the th strange things I've noticed, I'm sure there's many strange things that have happened with you over the last while, but, <laughs> you know, as the technology for putting music online increases in ease and accessibility. The sheer volume of music online also increases to the same degree. And then most people end up in the, it seems to produce a hyper steep Pareto distributions where virtually everyone who puts content on the line online gets 
pretty much zero attention. That would be especially true with music. And then a tiny fragment of people at the very pinnacle get volumes of attention that are essentially unimaginable. And you occupy kind of a strange mid territory, which <laughs> rather, well, which must be rather rare. You know, I mean, by your numbers, I think they have to be regarded as successful. That's certainly in terms of volume. Um, what does it mean to you in terms of monetization? And I, I asked this actually as a technical question, because I know that monetizing creative production is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. And so I'm wondering if you've had any success at that and how you're managing to keep body and soul together <laughs> while you pursue this, um, what would you call it, strange pathway. That's, that's probably accurate. I suppose it is a strange pathway, but it's, it's the only one that ever seemed viable to me. And uh, for many years, it was, it was uh, very difficult. I've, I've, you know, I've been doing this a long time and I kind of, I pioneered a lot of the way things work now. When I first got my first record deal, I, I had a website and I was releasing mixtapes online. So I was releasing these kind of long form projects that involved uh, songs and also cutting up bits of spoken audio and, and sort of sample collages and things. And uh, I was releasing them online and literally no one else was doing that at that point. And when I first, uh, worked with Interscope Records, their media department rang me up and asked me how the hell I was doing everything because they wanted to start rolling that out to all their other artists. So that was like 2004. And uh, after I parted ways with the record label, I had to essentially kind of create my own industry. So I was releasing mixtapes and things and t-shirts and all that sort of stuff. Streaming didn't exist at that point. We're now at the point where streaming uh, can make money oh well that's interesting to know but you have to stream a lot um, yeah. so it works out as at about four thousand dollars per million streams for example Jesus. just looking at streaming so you need right. to be listening to a lot of your stuff but that's you know, a rough lot. that's a rough percentage man <laughs> but you think about all the you know how many people there are in the world and uh and you know this insatiable hunger that people have for for music yeah, they're never going to not want to listen to music, and if you keep giving them good music that you know that, that they love and connect with, they they will always listen to it. And uh, there's increasing, you know, there's so many more places people hear music now than they used to. Music's in everything, every video, every film, every experience, every avenue, every Instagram story, every, every aspect of our culture has a soundtrack, and increasingly. And as we strive boldly into the future, I envisage people essentially having personalized soundtracks everywhere they go in every kind of instance. So, Right, so you see a continually expanding market. Yes, yes, definitely. And, uh, yeah, and there's, you know, and aside from, like, streaming, there's, there's various, you know, how it is, ways that you, there's, you can make a bit of money on YouTube, you can sell a few T-shirts, you can get a few subscription service people. There's all, all the things together if you work hard and you're consistent and you're good and uh you know you don't stop consistency is obviously the, f the fundamental then uh you can do it and uh right. you can thrive and uh, i'm starting to thrive and it feels good oh well congratulations yeah. that's you. i'm very impressed to hear that because it Thank seems you. like it seems like one of the world's more unlikely ways to thrive yes. i mean i, I mean <laughs> in, well in two ways i mean the first is that it's very difficult to make a career in music. So just as a baseline, that that's very difficult. And the second is, well, you've pioneered this new genre, which is also, well, as I said in the introduction, I don't really know what to make of it. <laughs> it's this combination of metered spoken words. So there's a bit of a poetic element to it. And then you're carefully selecting music to go with it and matching that cadence of the of the spoken word to the music and yeah. people and people seem to be responding to that and what what kind of reaction are you garnering from your audience i mean you must get a fair bit of correspondence what and i mean i've read some of the youtube comments and so forth so it seems to me and, and the overwhelming majority of those seem to be positive which is 
a good thing on YouTube because that's not necessarily the case. What kind of response are you getting from people and what do you think you're doing for them or to them? Yeah, the YouTube, the YouTube comments is kind of almost unheard of. It's, it's like 99.876% ridiculously positive. And uh, I receive literally hundreds of communications on a daily basis from people who tell me that this is helping them incredibly in their lives. It's, I mean, it's, I imagine it's similar to what I've heard you talking about getting. It's, the amount of people who write to me saying that they got off drugs or uh, they were, were going to commit suicide and things of that nature and then the music helped them find a reason and helped them to find the strength to get out of the trouble they were in and things of that nature. Yeah, that's a, that's a big deal, and it's it's very significant and specific, eh, to to imagine that the music that you're putting together and the meaning that it conveys has that effect both on addiction and on suicide. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously, it's a substitute. Well, uh, that's probably putting it wrong. It's... It's something that's providing the meaning that they're searching for both through their addiction and and the terrible meaning that they're trying to escape from as a consequence of their suicidal urges. Yeah. So, yeah, well, that's a, that's a big deal, and it's, it seems to me to be psychologically very significant. I mean, God only knows what psychological role music plays in our lives. I mean... I, I don't I was think gonna, I was going to ask you about this. Is there is there been much research done? Because from where I'm, you know, I'm a DJ. I'm out um, two to five nights a week playing music to people and seeing firsthand the effect it has on them. And yeah. I've been experimenting with this for years, trying different combinations of things in order to create certain reactions. My main thing I'm trying to do is give people an incredible transcendent experience right. to carry with them, not just for the rest of the week, but for the rest of their lives. But I've I've experimented with combining things to create drama, to create violence, to create lust, to create all sorts of things. And you could it's it's repeatable. It's it's you know it's it's repeatable in a scientific experiment capacity. Uh, so yeah, I was going to ask you, Aziz, if you're aware of any. Uh, no, research. not it's not really. It's quite uh, important. Well, yeah, I think that. I mean, it's conceivable that I'm ignorant of the literature, but I don't think. I am because I can't see how I would have not come across it in the research that I've done on creativity. Yeah. But the study of meaning as a phenomenon is a relatively new one. I mean, it emerged to the degree <laughs> that it has emerged sort of out of the, I mean, in psychology, out of the literature on happiness and well-being. And, and of course, that's not the same thing. And um, it isn't obvious that people know how to do the experiments properly or to take the measurements properly. So, and I think there's also a proclivity among psychologists um, to devalue the psychological importance of cultural products. You know, lots of evolutionary psychologists, for example, believe that our ability to produce art and to produce music, let's say, visual art and music, Mm. is like a secondary consequence of something more fundamental. Hmm. And I don't believe that. Like, I, I think people would literally die without music and drama and literature. I, I, I can't see that we could live. I don't think we could organize our minds without drama and literature. And I don't think, I think that music is so crucial that it actually keeps people, it's one of the many things it's one of the few things, sorry, that actually keep people sane, which is why it features so prominently in, well, let's say in church, in sacred celebrations. Yep. And, and, in, and in any activities where people gather together in, in groups for anything of any significance. And, you know, it's obviously it's the case that if you go to a concert and it's well handled, there's something going on there that's very much akin to a religious experience. Yeah, I don't see any difference when it's done properly, when all the people uh, involved are working together uh, to make it what it could be. Uh, it can be more, a more transcendental experience than anything. 
Yeah, I think yeah. I think the difference between it and most religious ceremonies that is that it actually works. <laughs> it does. I mean, I've seen people burst into tears when you at certain transitions, when right. you, which is when you move one song into another, and uh, when you're DJing or when I'm DJing anyway, I'm I'm making sure that those things have a purpose other than just playing another song. So the idea is that you're taking people on a, some sort of a journey, that you're telling a story from the beginning to the end of your set, and your set, all the songs you're playing, will have a beginning and a middle and an end, and the whole experience uh, will have some sort of transformative purpose, and it will move people in a way. And certain combinations of records, the way you'll bring in one into another, you, the way you'll sort of blend them, I've seen that make people burst into tears. Right. Most yeah, you can see that. At once, just spontaneously. You, you can see that sometimes with particularly good chord transitions too. Exactly. You know, there's something so deeply satisfying about the transformation of one pattern into another. It's, it, I don't know what it, well, this is why I've always been so fascinated by music because I think there's something unutterably deep about music. I really, re I really believe that it's the most representative form of art because I think that the world is made out of patterns. That's the best way to think of the world. And those patterns vary in duration, you know, and we're always in search for the longer duration patterns because they're more reliable. And some of those patterns we can exploit, let's say, as tools, and some we avoid as obstacles, but, and the rest we try to intermingle harmoniously with our actions and our thoughts so that the whole process turns into something that's symphonic, you know, and then you go, exactly. to, you go to a music festival and you hear well-arranged music in particular, because I think that's an edited music. Well, it all matters, the melodic composition and the words, all of that matters. But to hear it well-written and well-edited and well-arranged speaks to you about how the entire structure of the entire structure of being could be arranged and also is fortunately arranged those rare times where everything comes together for you and so people need that experience man it it, it reminds them of the potential harmony that that things can attain and that's that's not optional, especially if you're in a chaotic state. It's the truth. of it's, I think it's the truth of everything. And uh, that community, it's, what is it Stevie Wonder said? Music is the language we all speak. Mm -hmm. it's, a thing we all, it's something we all understand. And no, that's, that's true across the world, and I've seen that. And it's interesting how music will, will change from place to place, but the fundamental aspects of it are the same. And the fundamental need for it, is the same. Yeah, it's fa absolutely fascinating that there's so much, there's as many variations as there are languages, but we can understand all of them. I mean, you know, our language has a musical element, right? If you listen to someone who's an interesting speaker, there's a lot of melody in their speech patterns. This is why I first made uh, a sample you, because I, I heard the melody in something you were saying, and I could instantly hear what the song was around it. There was a rhythm in it. There was a melody in it, the whole thing. And uh, every individual has that. And it's often quite radically different, even within the same language. It's interesting, different languages have different melodies. And therefore, if you listen to uh, French music, the actual melodies in music are similar to the shape of the, the voice, the vocal sounds of the actual language. Uh, this is the same with Mexican, same with English so on and so forth. So like melodies within music of cultures are informed very much by the, the language that people speak. Mm -hmm. I wonder what makes English particularly appropriate by all appearances for rock and roll. Yes. Is it, is it, it's a fairly consonant heavy language. So maybe that has something to do with it. There's a, like it isn't, it hasn't got that same vowel like sing song that, Asian languages often have, so it's got a bit more of a beat-like harshness. But like rock doesn't seem to work very well in French. Germans manage to pull it off now and then, but not that often. It's really remarkably an English, 
experience altogether. And this that's a very why, true uh, thing. I think this is why hip hop has taken over the world. Hip hop is now the dominant genre everywhere. <clears throat> Pretty much everywhere. And uh, I spend a fair bit of my time researching music on a weekly basis as a part of my job and uh, listening to music in different countries. And, and hip hop has essentially taken over the whole world. And hip hop exists uh, in every language I've looked into. And it works in every language. Mm. And uh, there's multiple reasons for that. But just the thing we're talking about is interesting, like the sort of the shape. Like French sounds fantastic on rap. Far more so than uh, on, say, rock. I don't know. That's subjective. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, Eng in the, the English accent, we do a lot of uh, small sounds, then elongated sounds, which, um, what's that called? The uh, Scottish snap, the Sc which is uh, a thing that's in a lot of rap these days. It's like this type thing is a da 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 kind of goes in and out. Mm -hmm. also the sound you hear in a lot in old sort of folk music. Rock and roll is interesting because it's almost a perfect combination of uh, of European folk and African jazz and and traditional music. Right, right. Together, right. And it yeah. keeps coming out. There's been some recent little skirmishes of people accusing, say, Ariana Grande of cultural appropriation for using a rap rhythm in the cadence of her singing, but that rhythm is actually traced back to Scotland. Right. Well, one of the things that we should agree on right off the bat is that we don't have to pay any attention to anyone who ever dares to say anything about cultural appropriation, <laughs> given the absolute necessity of trading these modes of communication across the world and the unbelievable utility that that's had. And, and even the idea that it's a form of theft in terms of its motivation is so entirely specious because most of the time it's rooted in what I would regard as tremendous admiration. It's not like the Rolling Stones were massive fans of the, of the black blues artists from the U.S. You know, I mean, they were doing everything they could to imitate them. Yes. So, this, this is another one of, this is one of another, another one of the reasons why hip hop is taken over the world and could be considered the ultimate art form or maybe ultimate musical art form, uh, because it takes from everything within to itself to make mm. something new. And that's the reason it, there hasn't been a new musical genre, a new sort of specific, like, tentpole musical genre uh, since hip hop. Yeah, uh, yeah, it yeah. Right, right. And that's actually getting to be quite a while ago now. Yeah, it was about, that was the 70s. And so what happened was you had, and it's really amazing how hip hop was born. Hip hop was born because there was some rioting in New York and uh, some poor people managed to get their hands on some quite good sound equipment and start throwing parties with it. And uh, one of them worked out a way of playing the same record on two turntables at a slightly different part of the record on each side so he could create a loop over which, uh, from the record, over which somebody could rap, tell the story, hype up the crowd. Therein it was born. Uh, take from another piece of existing music or to another piece of existing idea. And, you know, they were sampling European dance. They were sampling craft work and they were sampling like weird folk stuff. And there was, you know, they were sampling James Brown. They were sampling from everywhere. Hip hop was taken from every bit of the existing music, musical multiverse. And then people could talk about anything. They could talk about their real experiences. They could talk about their fantasies. They could talk about their fears. Uh, I remember Chuck D once saying that the, the core story in hip hop was, could be boiled down to as simple as uh, I am, like I exist. Mm -hmm. Like the, the protest of it or, or, the, or the, the call of the story is just like I, I exist, I'm here. And then the music is, is as culturally appropriative as possible. It, they took from everywhere. And without, right. if they hadn't done that, it wouldn't exist. And if you suddenly start telling people, no, you can't do that anymore, then uh, you're going to end up with a sort of very dull... Well, the other thing, dead art form. If, if you look at it, again, from a psychological perspective, is that for me to understand you, I have to imitate you. That's the ground of understanding. It's not like I listen to what you say and then 
think about it and then react, although I do that to some degree. It's that I watch you. I look at what you're looking at. I listen to the cadence of your voice. You know, I adjust my body so that it's in accordance with yours. If we're having a real conversation, I have to. We have to create a space between us that's a consequence of a mutual imitation. Even changing the way that we speak, because I'm going to adjust the way I speak to the way you speak and vice versa, or we're not going to have a conversation. We have to enter into the same space, to use a terrible cliche, but all of that's a consequence of deep, deep, and often unconscious and implicit imitation. And to say that cultural appropriation is a mistake is to deny people the ability to deeply imagine each other. You know, because there are conversations going on now that a man should never write a woman's role or a white person should never write a black person's role. It's like, well, all you're doing is forbidding the creator to project him or herself into the landscape of that other person and try to and try to truly not not just empathy it's way deeper than empathy to try to live out their experience to the best of their imaginative ability in a deep way and maybe one that can be communicated with other people you know like maybe a white guy who writes about black experience and he's careful about it um can bridge a gap that no other person can bridge. And even though it might not be 100% accurate, and not to say that biography itself or autobiography itself is ever 100% accurate, it's the best we can do with regards to climbing inside someone else's skull and, and attempting to truly walk a mile in their shoes, let's say. You know, I read a great book by a woman named Margaret Lawrence, who's a very underrated Canadian author, and she wrote a book called The Stone Angel, which was about a about an 88-year-old woman, I think, an elderly, elderly woman. And, and Margaret Lawrence was not that age when she wrote the book, and I certainly wasn't an 88-year-old woman when I wrote it. And I found it profoundly affecting. Like, it was the first time in my life that I had really understood that you're the same when you're old, you know, like very much of you is like you were when you were 30 or 40. It's just that while well, you've started to deteriorate physiologically and, and sometimes, but not always psychologically, but all of the emotions and all of the perceptions and the desires and longings and the doubts and all of that are, are there just as powerfully. And I don't think I would have understood that until I was much, much older had I not had the uh, the good fortune of encountering that book. So I, I think that the people who are discussing cultural appropriation, I truly believe that they hate art because that, that, that is art, man. That's take from the best of everything and, and see if you can go one step farther. Yeah. They, they just haven't thought it through because the end result of that is that uh, you can only write... Basically, you only have uh, autobiography. You couldn't have uh, a comic book unless it was written by a team of 30 people if it contained 30 characters. It's, it's, it means putting everyone into, back into their little boxes and not allowed to integrate with the world. It means that no one... Right, knows. exactly that. And it means that art dies... Hmm. Uh, well, I, I think that's the point of the complaint is that, that, that there's a true hatred for art that lurks underneath that and a desire for it to be replaced by a kind of propaganda. I mean, even if you wrote autobiography, you wouldn't be able to write about anyone else. Yes, exactly. You know, it's, there's a lot of people complain about modern art and, uh, you know, the, the, assault on, the assault on beauty or the, this war on beauty, this kind of rejection of, of, of uh, skill and uh, transcendent, obviously transcendent greatness uh, in lieu of kind of like ugly things that remind us of that. Let me ask you about the people that you've chosen yes. to, to feature in your... Mean, is it best referred to as meaning wave or as lo-fi? And what, what do you, what's the difference? 
Well, like, yeah, Meaning Wave is, is what this genre of music I'm working on has come to be known as. And it is the combination, as you put, of the, uh, the, meaning, of, of the meaningful speech with uh, wave music. Wave music is uh, lo-fi. Uh, it's trap, it's vapor trap, it's cloud, cloud rap. It's a bunch of different things. Uh, but they share a common aesthetic, vapor wave, things of that nature which is uh, amusingly a postmodern art form. Uh, lo-fi just means low fidelity. So I've always made lo-fi because when I first started making hip-hop, uh, it sounded quite bad because I didn't know what I was doing. So it was quite low, low quality. Uh -huh. uh, lo-fi just means, uh, you know, maybe there's some record crackle or maybe you've... Uh, it's not the most polished sounding thing. It's not top 40 radio. It's, it's not... I've been considering... Uh, doing another project called Hi-Fi, which goes in the exact opposite direction and just goes pristine, clean, what have you. But anyway, so lo-fi is that. Meaning Wave is where I took those musical forms and combined them with, with speech. And then did you see some advantages in the lo-fi approach apart from its initial technical simplicity? I've always loved that sound. I've always loved warm, analog, crackly sounds. I've always loved hip-hop. All lo-fi hip-hop is really is just hip-hop instrumentals with, uh, without an emphasis on high-tech production. I, would I say. see. Um, so it means that... So you, you, think it's, you think it's more comforting and welcoming yeah. to people? I mean, I've often yes. been in buildings, you know, like modern buildings that are so perfect that the only thing that shouldn't be there is you. Indeed. Yeah, that is, it's, it's a creepy feeling. It uh, is. It is a creepy feeling because, like, there's some degree of imperfection that seems to be need or age wornness well we had this happen with music so technology is what uh, drives music always the reason that music sounds like it does currently uh, a lot of it is te te to do with technology there's a drum kit that's used on almost all music you'll hear on the radio which is the 808 kit and that's been uh, kind of dominated music for the past 10 to 20 years. And the reason for that is because it sounds really as good coming out of a, a telephone as it does a club system. And uh, the drum kits they were using before that just don't pop out of a phone in the same way. You can't really hear them. Uh, so until phones can more accurately, accurately reproduce low end, that drum kit will remain very popular. But what happened with music anyway, we saw it as the 80s, technology came in, computers came in, synthesizers came in, and it started getting really, really clean sounding, like really, really clean. And then as people started working within computers and the music, oftentimes the music would never leave the computer. It'd be made on a Mac, it'd go through some fiber optic cables into someone else's Mac or into another phone. And uh, it, it was that became that kind of cleanliness you were talking about, that kind of sterilized thing. And uh, lo-fi reintroduces real-world analog elements to the thing, which brings uh, a humanity and a nostalgia and a sort of tactile feeling that uh, music had started to lose, which I think is why people love yeah, it. Yeah, well, there's something about analog instruments that, that have a singing quality that the electronic instruments, even at the highest end, lack. Like, I notice when I'm playing the piano, which I'm not very good at, but... I can do at least to some degree. If I play an electronic piano, every note is okay and all the chords are okay, but I can't get the whole instrument to sing. And then, like, if the whole instrument is singing because of endless resonance, then you can start to overlay the chords on the resonance, and, and it, it makes the entire experience much richer and deeper and that seems to me a very, to be a very hard thing to duplicate on electronic instruments. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, the, the uh, limitless potential that technology has brought us is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But at the same time, we don't want to be throwing out the proverbial baby with the proverbial bathwater and losing that foundational quality. So I think kind of a situation where you can have aspects of both working together harmoniously is... Uh, optimal and mm -hmm. that's what i've been that's what i've been trying to do um, so you get some of the messy complexity of analog with the perfection and 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 like endless possibility of electronic yeah there's stuff you can do with electronic that you cannot do with with analog and physical i can uh i can sample you playing the piano 
And then I could go in there and if I wanted, I could go in and change a chord. I could go in there and get the notes separated and move one of them around just to slightly change the chord. Uh, there's, there's stuff we can do which blows my mind now. There's things coming out every week. AI has started, well, machine learning. They call it AI. Yeah, machine yeah. Learning, has started to come into music production. And uh, there's some incredibly exciting things happening in that area. Uh, but the trick is, as always, is not to get carried away with these things and lose the foundational aspects uh, when, in, you know, when we embrace these things. Right. Yeah, well, I noticed the other day that Google had this little game on its search page where you could go and type in a simple melody on a note on a um, staff that they had provided and that it would convert it to a Bach analog by analyzing 400 different Bach pieces and then determining how it would be corded and how it would progress. You know, and it was difficult to evaluate because it was very short and uh, the fidelity was relatively low, but, but it's pretty damn impressive that an AI system can go and evaluate 400 pieces of box music and then rewrite something that has the same spirit based on a separate melody in a matter of seconds. It, and I mean, the thing about all this new technology is that barring catastrophe, <laughs> barring... <laughs> Good time for everything to blur, I would say. Oh, yeah. um, barring catastrophe, it's all brand new. And it's going to be so much better in 20 years that we can't even imagine it. You know, because you, you kind of think, well, this is a new technology. And you think, well, it's new. It's like, and, and it's like finished in some sense. And we're, we're so much at the infancy of this electronic revolution that it's almost impossible to even imagine. I'm very, very excited about where we will be in 20 years, just based off of watching my six-year-old son, Hercules, play Minecraft with his best friend, Quincy, who lives in Canada. And uh, these, little, these little kids creating these galaxies, creating these huge worlds, create, like down from the smallest details of building little houses and putting beds in them and looking in the drawers, down to zooming out and creating like, whole environments and things. And, uh, and working together and like, you know, Quincy is very good at this kind of thinking and this kind of stuff. And Hercules is very good at a different kind of thing. And they just harmoniously come together to create this stuff within these, these supercomputers that the size of a paperback. Right. So and they're generation, all worlds. Yeah. And a generation who've grown up with that just being default, just expecting to be able to imagine a thing and make it so. Mm -hmm. You know, when we were, when I was uh, a little kid, I would sort of, I would draw comics and things of that nature. And I would imagine things and I would draw them and they would look a bit like I imagined, you know, and I, I practiced drawing and I got pretty good at it. But I could never get out exactly what I was thinking, but you'd get an idea. Um, you know, these kids can really imagine vast, vast things and, and look at them and see if they work and they go, oh, this doesn't work. And I will destroy that and do another thing and so on and so forth. So when these kids uh 20 what are the, what the hell are they going to do this is a, a generation uh whose imagination whose expectation of being able to create what they imagine has no limits on it a generation who from as long as they could remember had su all had a supercomputer that was the most powerful mov movie studio in existence the most powerful recording studio a magazine you know they can publish they can talk to anyone in the world they can published to anyone in the world they don't have limits on their creation. no no every everybody's a media powerhouse but also a problem solving powerhouse in a way and when they work together that's what's really interesting this kids playing minecraft together they don't need to say okay you're good at this you do that they just work it out and then do it and they go at a problem and they fix it and uh yeah what well, i'm just really excited about what they're going to do hmm Hmm. Do you and do you look and watch what he creates? Yes, and it's 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 beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah. It's like you know Sistine Chapels. Like you zoom out and it's fractals, and you zoom in and it's like he's made a little house for his buddy, or he's made a statue of his friend, or he's built a roller coaster, or, 
or whatever it is. And then he'll set it all on fire or something. He'll become mm-hmm. an angry god and he'll, he'll, he'll throw lava at the thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, the, but, you know, because so many barriers that previous generations had are evaporating. And you have that, you have the, you know, the barriers of education or the barriers, like I was talking about earlier. You only used to be able to have 12 rock stars at once because there were only 12 covers of Rolling Stone. Right. You know, so uh, that's why uh, Michael Jackson tried to get Prince destroyed. Or was it? The, yeah, it was. Because, you know, it was like, well, there's only, oh, no, this, yeah, first there was that. And then they kind of like joined forces against uh, Terence Trent Darby. According to Terence Trent Darby, because Terence Trent Darby, uh, was uh, a threat because he was like a third black guy and you're only mm-hmm. allowed to, and at that point there was statistically only room for two black guys because of the amount of covers of Rolling Stone. Right, that, right. There's some that, limiting factor. Yeah, but that doesn't expect. exist anymore. That doesn't exist anymore. There's, uh, you, nowadays you can be a cult person like say Young Lean who's a Swedish rapper that mainstream people wouldn't know of but everything he releases gets millions of streams and views and he can tour the world and live com- comfortably forever. Uh, you know, the barriers for uh, education. You can learn everything you can learn online. Right, so now you, have, now you have niche celebrities. Yeah. You which is very strange things. Yes. Because you, you, you wouldn't expect that to be a possibility, but with the massive... I mean, I think there's two and a half billion people on YouTube, and God only knows what the total reach of the podcast networks are. And so you can have a pretty sizable following on any of those platforms and be invisible to the majority of the people who are on them. Yes. It's, it's, yeah, it's an incredible thing. You know, this is why they, they, they hate PewDiePie. God bless him. Uh, PewDiePie, (laughs) it's amazing that you have a situation where the biggest person on the biggest online, uh, broadcasting platform is somehow underground and anti-establishment. Yeah, well, I think That's it's. I think I think it's evidence that this new media world is underground and anti-establishment in in the most profound possible way. Like Indeed. I can't I can't see how broadcast television can possibly survive YouTube. No, it's dead. And this is another reason I'm very excited about this generation because not only has this generation got this uh, Minecraft limitless potential actualization, incredible computer skills, coding skills. He's learning to code, young Hercules, six years old, just so that he can create portals in Minecraft and open a portal to another dimension. The fact that he's interested in opening portals to other dimensions and has that as a thing in his vocabulary is incredible. But right. then you combine that with uh, this complete disdain for uh, you know, mainstream media or, or, uh, or those, sorts of, those sorts of systems, uh, It's like, what is going to happen? What are they going to do? I guess one question that that raises for me is, what is it that's going to hold us together? You know, I mean, one of the things, and this might just be the, what would you call it? Nostalgia of someone who's old enough to have a certain amount of nostalgia. I mean, with the limited broadcast means that we had when I grew up, You know, I had three television channels when I grew up, at least to begin with, and one of them was in French, so it didn't really count. (laughs) And a limited number of radio stations and so forth and and newspapers. There was a a continually emergent consensus about what constituted the real, you know, in the social and political realm at least, and even in the physical world to some degree. And part of that, I think, was that many of those venues of communication were actually very carefully vetted and edited. You know, and I would say Time magazine would, would have fallen into that category because it was quite a magazine in its heyday, you know, a quarter of an inch thick and almost, almost nothing but solid text, very carefully written. And you could quibble about the biases and accuracy of the reporters, but they seemed to be professionals and they seem to be well supervised and well regulated and of course there's danger in over supervision and hyper regulation but what seems to happen now is that 
it's almost possible, and, and maybe this is what the postmodernists were imagining, you know, in some sense, or intuiting, that we were entering a world where there would be so many different interpretations of what was real that virtually everyone could extract out from the endless stream of communication that construction of the world that seemed to suit them best for better or worse. And there's a fragmentation that goes along with that that seems to me to be, well, maybe dangerous. Is it dangerous enough to be driving some of the nihilism that seems evident and some of the ideological rigidity? Yeah, nihilism was a, an unavoidable byproduct of, of the line of questioning that humans were going down. But I think they're starting to come out of that. And that's another thing in this, uh, this new generation I'm seeing is a, uh, a swing back against nihilism. Yeah, you think. And so, yeah, well, that would account for the popularity of the meaning wave. And so yeah. what, what, why do you, what makes you confident in that? I mean, I'm, I'm hoping very much that you're correct in your assumption, but what makes you confident in that? Well, I think it's historically visible that we always, you always see this. People always react against their parents and so on and so forth. There's always that pendulum swing backward and forward. It's, it's like, as you said, it's always these patterns, an observable pattern, which I've been aware of since, uh, since I was a kid, uh, is the seven-year cycle from uh, punk to psychedelia, which swings backwards and forwards like a ticking clock, uh, and it has done my whole life. And uh, so that's sort of like a swing between complexity and simplicity, or all right, think about it this complexity way: complexity and rawness. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a cult it's a cultural phenomenon, but everything, a great deal of what occurs is downstream from culture. Uh, so, if you think the sort of late nineties, sorry, the the late eighties, we had a summer of love of sorts. We had a hippie period. Acid house music was going. People were dressing in bright colors. Uh, things were all combining together, rap and dance and all these things. And people were taking MDMA and acid and stuff of that nature. Rave culture was a big thing. Then uh, it swung back into uh, punky nihilisticness. And this happens in, in the colors people wear, what people dress. It suddenly went into Nirvana, talking about killing like misery. And it went into uh, Britpop in the UK. Things became more conservative in their, in their sonics and, their, and the clothes styles were people wearing. And then it went uh, psychedelic again. Uh, to the point, I, I was thinking about this earlier. I was like, oh my God, they actually legalized mushrooms in London at the year I calculated to be the peak of that particular seven-year psychedelic cycle. Then it swung back again. Music went into emo. Um, then it went back again. The more recent one, 2013, was the peak of the more recent psychedelic -y thing. Uh, we had Odd Future as the biggest rap group, people wearing tie-dye. Uh, everyone, Drugs-wise, it was uh, Molly, which is MDMA again. And then it swung back into nihilism. And it's, like, it's kind of like the, uh, you know, those pirate ship rides. It's like a pirate boat. And you pull up, and you see it, and then you go, shoom, down. And it did that in 2013. And then suddenly, the drug had switched to Xanax. It was all downers, uh, punk and goth stuff became the kind of cultural signpost. Colors went into black, fonts went into gothic. Uh, the conspiracy culture went from talking about aliens to uh, complaining about uh, feminism and all those people that were interested in psychedelic out there stuff up until 2013 was suddenly not anymore. And now it's starting to swing back in the other direction again. And, uh, but this time, because we're all networked so much at this point, the whole psychedelic thing is going to be a lot more psychedelic and a lot more powerful and have a lot more of a lasting impact, I believe. Over so now, now you've picked Alan Watts and Jocko Willink and Terrence McKenna and David Foster Wallace and Elon Musk. And like, how do you select the people from whom you derive your meaning wave albums and tracks well we're talking we're, it's looking at the puzzle from a different angle which is valid which is useful so it's like i used to make music wherein i would rap and sing so i was rapping and singing and then i got to a point where i realized that i didn't yet know enough 
to make an album about what I wanted to make an album about. My first album was about was called When We Were Young, and it was about being a kid. And my second album was about uh, uh, the life equation was about kind of uh, being not a kid and interfa interfacing with the world. But the third album, what that needed to be about, I didn't know enough yet. And then I started listening to lots of people and listening to their position, their perspectives on things. And you know, say between you and Alan Watts, you're you're in a way doing what Alan Watts did for Eastern culture for Western culture. And, a, and it's in a funny way because it's like you have a generation or two that don't have knowledge of these fundamental aspects of sort of Western culture. It was sort of stolen from them. And you've come along and you're reintroducing that to people in a foundational fashion. And Alan Watts did a similar thing, but with uh, Eastern ideas. Terence McKenna talks about a lot of the same stuff you talk about, but from a specific angle, a different <laughs> angle to the way you look at it. And it's also, I think of it in archetypes in a way, and you say someone like Jocko Willink is the warrior, perhaps. And that's his, his is a very, very necessary perspective at this point. It's similar in ways to yours. It has aspects of sort of discipline and stuff of that nature, but in a, you know, in a much, he, he's looking at a very specific site uh, at which he is expert. I just thought it would be this incredible, powerful thing if you could take people Somebody who's thought about a specific thing for 30 years and make that into pop music that people could listen to in the gym or in the shower or wherever they were, and they could really, really bring it into their lives. You're not necessarily going to listen to a podcast more than once, even a really, right. really good one. But if I take the, the mo what I think are the most interesting or best bits of a podcast and turn them into a pop song, you could listen to that 100 times, and it could right. get in, and you could really think about it, and you could really integrate it into your life or integrate the, the bits of it. That, that are useful to you. Yeah, so, yeah well, so. I mean, that, that's how people learned historically, right? They set poetry to music and listened to it over and over, and that made it stick. This is so the, pre, the, pre, the oral tradition, indeed. Because the first thing I did was when I, the, I left school when I was 16, but my last exams, the revision I did for them involved me just reading my revision notes over ambient music in a cassette recorder, and then playing it when I went to sleep, which is which was I guess the first meaning wave that mm -hmm. I made. Mm -hmm. Right, right. But yeah, this is what we've been doing for thousands of years. Yeah, well, it's a lot easier to remember something if it's presented in a multimodal way, right? So you have the words, you have the rhythm, you have the rhyming, and you have the music. I mean, so. Basically, you're remembering it along five dimensions at the same time instead of just trying to extract out the abstract semantic meaning and, and store that, which is, that's very effortful, you know. And I'm not even sure you can do it without going through those first stages. Which stages? Well, the stages of, of rhythm and... Oh, yeah, 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 sorry. And memorization and... You know, I, I don't know how well you have to know something from the perspective of memorization, let's say, before you can start to really think about it deeply and to transform it your own way. This, well, this is it. You know, people used to remember whole books, right? Yeah. People would be walking around with volumes and volumes of, of, of poetry and books in their heads, and they'd be able to, like, you know, just whip it out. I mean, it's just that people used to, I mean, even in my lifetime, people had catalogs of jokes and stories that right. they would have ready to throw out there in a pub conversation or, or whatever it was. And uh, that seems to be declining somewhat. It's one of the, the unfortunate results of this wonderful technology. That yes, we yes. Well, we seem to externalize everything, you know. Yeah, because we can put everything in the cloud now, so we don't need to save it on our hard drive. Right, right. And it makes, you, it makes you wonder what there is that's in you. I saw this funny New Yorker cartoon a while back where a man came out with a fact of some sort and his wife says, well, do you know that or do you just Google know it? Yeah. And, and there's a big difference between having a fact at your disposal because you can find it in a library and actually having that fact in your cognitive toolbox so that you can use it actively in your life. And, you know, it's, it's certainly been unbelievably useful for me to create and remember a bank of stories 
and it, it makes you a much more, much, much more effective communicator and a much better thinker. Like when I was a kid in grade eight or grade nine, you know, when we were asked to memorize poetry, I always felt that, that was such a waste of time that, well, it was already written down in a book. What good did it do for me to be able to, to recite it? And, you know, then I met a guy years ago, years later, who was an undergraduate and uh, a remarkable person, genius and rather unstable, unfortunately. So I don't think he ever amounted to much. But one of the things he could do was declaim large sections of Shakespeare at a moment's notice, apropos. And it was unbelievably impressive. Like, you know, when he would start it, everybody in the room would fall silent. And like, and he was very good at it. it you know, he, he wasn't embarrassing himself by bursting into this, into this old English prose. It was a real accomplishment. And that was the first time that I saw how empty modern people were in some sense because they don't have that interiorized verbal culture you know now it's not sure it's not clear that in more archaic societies everybody had that either it, from what i've understood it was the shamanic types that were the vast repository of the entire oral tradition but people had their stories and um well you need to have your story so i don't know what it is exactly that we're going to substitute for that yeah, well, you know, we're in a, we're st as you said, this has just begun. We're still, you know, in, the, in sort of zooming out terms, we're still, we're still in, in utero. Yeah. Species. We've yet to be born. And I think we're, I think we're coming close to being born, uh, which is why uh, everything is the way it is. And it's such a, it's such a heightened, it's, it's just an incredible period of history to exist in at this point. You know, you could, have been, you could have been born at any time, and for most of human history, you'd have been suffering away unless you were some kind of lord, and even then you'd have had wooden teeth if you were really lucky. There's right, a, and they didn't fit very well. No, exactly. Jesus Christ, imagine. There's a thing Hercules said, the good thing about having kids, as, as I'm sure you know, is they, um, obviously you know, is they just say really, really smart things that make you think. And Hercules, there's a thing in Minecraft where you have uh, survival mode and creative mode. In survival mode, uh, it, nighttime comes and the monsters come out to get you and you have to go hide in your house and hope that the monsters don't get you. And uh, there are limitations on you. And in creative mode, there, are, there aren't these limitations and you can fly and you can build and play. And Hercules just, it just turns around to me, not seemingly inspired by anything that just happened. I said, Dad, I wish it could be creative mode in real life, just for one day, because really we're in survival mode and we have to eat and we have to work and die. He goes, I would just love it to be creative mode and just fly into the sky and play just for one day. Hmm. And I thought, what a beautiful thing. And then I thought, but hang on, this is actually what we're doing. Right. About a week later, I thought that. And I was like, this is actually what we're doing as a species. For the first time, a, a vast proportion of us aren't spending all of our time just trying to stay alive. We're in creative mode. Yes, at least some of the time. And that's something yes, to be very... Exactly very grateful for because as you said, it's really well it's unbelievably new it's it's crazily new i mean people so where does that lead god who knows Hey, eh? hopefully it leads to everybody playing together nicely so that we can build a better world you know and i would say there's a reasonable amount of evidence that that's occurring i mean for all of its catastrophic problems the internet works pretty well i mean it it's given us a tremendous plethora of gifts even something you know i'm not saying trivial because it's not but taken for granted as google maps has had a profound effect on the way people live you're never lost anymore and it's enabled technologies like Uber, which and I think Uber is a wonderful technology. I think the fact that now anybody who's unemployed but has a functional vehicle can almost immediately find a way to make 500 or or $1,000 in a week or a week and a half is an absolute bloody miracle. I mean, it, I might be wrong about this, but it seems like that kind of poverty 
you know, barring inability to drive and other catastrophes, that kind of poverty where you're backed in a corner and you're just screwed. There's nothing you can do about it. That's Uber seems to have made a lot of that disappear. It's like, hey, man, you can't make a fortune, but you can make enough to get yourself out of a tight spot. And it's actually a pretty pleasant experience. Like, I like taking Ubers. There's no financial transaction. People are almost always polite. You know exactly where the car is going to be. Like, I don't know. I think I think it's been a really good thing. So, and it's, of course, only one of God. One of, of an infinity of miracles that are unfolding before us like, like firecrackers at every given second. It's yes. magical. There's, on that thing, you know, if you, if you, there are so many ways to make money now. If, if you're completely skillless, you can go on Let Go or Facebook. Gary Vee talks about this sort of stuff a lot. Uh, you know, you can, people are giving away chairs. I don't want this chair anymore. You go yeah. take the chair, then you sell it for $10. You do that all day. You can, you can make hundreds of dollars in a day. You don't have to have any skills whatsoever. They can, if you do have skills, there's a million ways for you to make money. And if you don't have skills, there's a million ways for you to get those skills. There are 12 year olds on YouTube who will show you how to do everything. Yeah. And I, and I, and I love those 12 year olds and I use them all the time. Right. Right. Yeah. God for those 12 year olds. Right. No, well, absolutely. Well, and you get these old guys down in like the Southern U S who are like old plumbers or, you know, they've <laughs> got some specialty that they're good at and they'll, grab their iPhone roughly and just gruffly vi- film themselves fixing something. Say, ah, oh, that's how you fix that. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's so, it's such an interesting manifestation of altruism, you know, and, and in the mm-hmm. indication, I mean, people obviously like the attention that their videos garner. And I think that's perfectly reasonable because it's a form of indication that what you're doing is valuable. You know, I mean, there's an ego element to it, but the ego element is, in fact, the fact that what you're doing is valuable. And it's so cool that people will take the extra effort. Like, I was installing a stereo in this old car of mine a while back, and, you know, it it, it was a pretty old car, like 11 or 12 years, and somebody had put up a video about how to install the stereo in the car, and I would have never it's figured it out. Car. That specific car, yeah. And I would have never figured it out because there was hidden screws and all sorts of weird things that needed to be known. And the guy didn't have to do it. You know, it was just good of him to do it. And it certainly saved me a lot of time and energy. So that was quite that was quite wonderful. Yeah, it would be really something if part of what the coming technological revolution enabled us to do would be to play and to play more effectively in a way that would translate into real world results, you know, and, and it is, it's conceivable that that's one of the consequences. I mean, all these people that are learning to code and learning to use computers in a sophisticated way. I mean, God, they're just, you know, you know, the Chinese graduate more engineers every year than the Americans have engineers. <laughs> What's this other thing that's coming down the pipeline is this Babelfish thing. Uh, you know, this translation technology, which is already bloody good. But in a few years, it's going to be seamless. Yeah. I will be able to talk to you and you will be speaking a different language, shall we say. Uh, and instantly that will be translated to me and I'll be able to have a conversation with you in my language and we'll understand each other. So that means that Twitter opens up to China. And well, I mean, government's allowing, but so, but you know what I mean? Like th- these sorts of uh, current online ex- community experiences we have open up to the world. And it also means that trade opens up to the world. And it also means all that information you're talking about opens up to the world. Because now you don't just watch the video of the guy in Ohio. You watch the video of the guy in Tokyo or wherever. Right. Like, yeah. And you understand yeah. it. And suddenly the sum of human knowledge and experience and usefulness is shared with everybody. Right, right. Yes, it's quite, it's quite, well, ha, unfortunately, at the same time, the, the sum of human <laughs> foolishness and, and impulsivity as well, which is, yes. you know, I guess par for the course, but something that we're trying to desperately learn how to manage. Um, hey, uh, just out of curiosity, 
How long would it take you to queue up 42 Rules for Life? How do you mean? I was in Stop Playing It. Yeah. Could, I mean, would this be a good Across time? This connection. Yeah. Why not? Why not, DJ Peterson? Let's do it, man. Let's play some of it. <laughs> Tell the truth. Or at least, don't lie. Do not do things that you hate. Act so that you can tell the truth about how you act. Pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. If you have to choose, be the one who does things instead of the one who is seen to do things. Pay attention. Assume that the person you are listening to might know something you need to know. Listen to them hard enough so that they will share it with you. Plan and work diligently to maintain the romance in your relationships. Be careful who you share good news with. Be careful who you share bad news with. Remember that what you do not yet know is more important than what you already know. Be grateful. In spite of your suffering. What's been the most exciting project that you've embarked on so far, do you think? What, what's been the most gratifying project? Is that a reasonable question? That's a reasonable question, but the, the answer is that each one is more exciting and gratifying than the last. Ah. Which ties into this hyperproductivity, uh, staying in the zone and refusing to leave experiment because it compounds. Is that the right word? It just yeah. Uh, yeah. It just gets more and more intense and, uh, and better and exciting. There are synchronicities just in, that just keep popping up and popping up and becoming myriad and ridiculous. Uh, and I've taken, I've taken synchronicities to be as signposts is what I'm treating those as. Malcolm X said that when you spot synchronicities, you're walking with Allah. Mm -hmm. uh, Grant Morrison always said it was the first step to becoming a, a successful chaos magician was noticing those synchronicities and paying attention. So I, I treat those things, and I, they're just every project I do, there's more and more and more of that as I, as I keep in this thing and, and sort of don't stop. The, the last one I did, which was Clockwork Elves, which was the Terence McKenna project, I just meant to do one song. I'd finished the Alan Watts album. I was like, I'm going to do this one Terence McKenna song about his Clockwork Elves thing. This is interesting. and ties into something that Watts was talking about. And um, I sort of came out of a daze at, mid, at sort of three in the morning and I'd made an album. <laughs> and it was almost like I didn't do it. It's like, and then I've been thinking about this quite a lot. There's a thing in uh, Japanese anime you see a lot, these, uh, these, me these mecha suits, which are like these giant robot suits, and then humans sort of pilot them. But they're these amazing suits, and a human can get in that, and they can, you can destroy a city or, you know, whatever it is. I kind of feel that when you're doing this stuff, optimizing yourself in this fashion, um, becoming really, really good at a thing, becoming really proficient, cutting out areas of wastefulness, uh, becoming this finely tuned machine. At that point, you then sort of hand the keys to God, as it were. Stevie Wonder always said that he didn't write his songs. He kind of opened himself up and God wrote them through him. Well, you know, you, you've developed such a body of expertise now in relationship to this. So much of what you do has become automatized. You know, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that you've developed expert circuitry for all sorts of pieces of it. And as you become better at something, it's necessary to stand back increasingly and let what you already know, you let what you already know dominate you and take you over. And, and then you add a creative bend and twist here and there 
to stop it from being merely rote, you know, like someone yeah. who's great at playing a cello, you know, they have every technique down perfectly, but they bend and twist each note consciously to, to add something new to it. When you hit that zone, it, it, it does mean that, well, everything that you've worked at to that point is starting to run automatically. And there is an experience of harmony, I would say, with, with deeper parts of being when that occurs. And, and it's not surprising because if you've put that circuitry together honestly and diligently and courageously, then it should be functioning properly and towards the good. And so when you're in the throes of that, if you're fortunate, then there should be almost nothing about that that isn't good. That's, that's why, that's partly why character is so important. You know, what people don't understand or, or they're not taught is that you genuinely become what you practice yes. and not, and not at some trivial level. I mean, it's built into you biologically as well yeah. as spiritually. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's terrifying. You go through life. And uh, the reason that one of the reasons life feels like it's speeding up is because you turn things into habits, right? And then your brain kind of fast forwards past the habit. Yeah. You're the, if you go on the same route to work every day, your brain will fast forward through that thing unless something different happens. So a lot of times people feel life is speeding up because they've just turned so much stuff into habit. So you have to be really careful about what you are allow to become habit. And you have to keep checking on what your habits are. Because at the same time, you want to turn useful things into habits. Right. You want yeah, well, that's part of the that's part of the tremendous difficulty of the balance between order and chaos. Exactly. You know, I mean, because order does become invisible and unconscious, and with the proclivity to become tyrannical and sterile. But it's absolutely necessary because it makes you efficient and allows you to do things that need to be done more than once with a high degree of accuracy and 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 expertise but then there's that ad ad mixture of the new that has to well that's what that's what again i think that's what music signifies because there's a fair bit of repetition in all music and that gives you a baseline expectation of what's going to happen you know yeah. so you're playing a game along with the musician and you both basically know the rules but what you're hoping that the musician will do is break the rules at least to some degree in some way that shocks you a bit and keeps you interested and allows you to understand new possibilities. That's exactly what makes a great DJ set. You want to have the right, the right balance of stuff that a person knows and makes them feel good and want to dance, but then something that sort of shocks them and surprises them and takes them somewhere they weren't quite expecting. There's this thing I've been doing recently where I, I force myself to play 50% stuff I haven't played before or mm. the way I haven't played before. Cause I, I found at one point I'd found myself sort of falling into a, like I knew all so many things that worked. It was really easy for me to unleash these combinations of things that work like in a fighting game where you like press combine these various moves and you have like, you unleash like a series of fighting moves and you can knock the person out. And I could do that very, very easily. But, uh, the really exciting things to do and the really useful to do the things to do is to keep coming up with new ones and make sure about half of what you're doing is in the area of danger and the creation of something new, which, cause that's what leads to those moments where the hairs stand up on. on right. It. Right. Yeah. Well, you have to have that element of, I would say surprise, but also of the potential for failure. Exactly. Right. Because exactly. I mean, I, I noticed this with my lectures is that, you know, before I go out and do a lecture, I always have, I spend about an hour meditating, although I hate to use that word, <laughs> but it is what I'm doing, trying to figure out what problem I'm trying to address and then trying to walk my way through the story that would enable me to explore that problem. But then I always have about five minutes of sheer terror <laughs> about the fact that it might not work. Like, I might not get the problem formulated properly, and I might not get through the story and come up with a, the point. Because, you know, the talk should have a point. 
there should be a conclusion or perhaps multiple conclusions, but at least one conclusion. And because I mix enough of what's new in each lecture, it isn't obvious to me that that's necessarily going to happen. Now, I've been fortunate so far, and it's happened each time I've lectured publicly. Which is how many times now? Oh, well, for the 12 Rules for Life tour, it's 150 cities. You know, and so I'm becoming somewhat confident in my ability to manage it because I've done lectures when I was, you know, barely feeling able to drag myself onto the stage. And once I'm on there and warm up a bit, you know, it, it, it goes well. And yeah, I think part of that too, and maybe you experience this as a DJ, like I really feel that it's a privilege to be up in front of the audience and it's also a challenge to get them on board, right? Because we're all trying to be in the same place at the same time doing the same thing. And you have to have a real sympathy for your audience in the deepest way. You have to identify with your audience. You know, I think you have to feel yourself as part of your audience rather than the person who's, say, lecturing to the audience before you can bring everyone along because it can't be a can't exactly be a top-down thing no, no, it has no. to be a participatory thing well it's, i always think of it in terms of this kind of like energy triangle or something it's like you give off this thing and then it comes back to you and then it goes back around again and it's this, this right that's going on even if it's it's i mean it's obviously unspoken in a dj capacity you're not having a conversation with words but you're giving them something, they're giving you energy in return in response to what you give them, and then you build it, and you build it, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's a, it that's it. It's, it's, a positive, it's a positive feedback loop, eh? Yes, exactly. And, and you can, I mean, those can go out of control, but if you can keep them modulated... That's why I had to stop drinking. <laughs> because uh -huh. my, my reason for drinking while DJing that I'd given to myself is, well, I need to be on the same level as my crowd. They're all drunk. Uh -huh. So I should be a little bit drunk. But then... Uh, then you get your thing distorted. And there's all, there's all, well, as we know, there's all sorts of, of problems with drinking. And uh, the nightlife industry is... is oh, yeah, it's notorious. Functioning alcoholics. Oh, definitely. Or well, it's no wonder. Alcoholics. I mean, like a big part of, not all of it, but a big, big part of what determines the probability of addiction is situation. And the yeah. other thing, too, is that someone like you or another musician, say, or a bartender... Nighttime people tend to drink more. So, yeah. it's, and it's partly because they're up at night, but it's also partly because the way they're structured biochemically. And then, of course, you're always around people who are drinking. And then, what do you do after you're done your sets? I mean, it's the party's on. Exactly. So, well, yeah. I mean, oh, I've, yeah. Got this, I've got this fixed now. But yeah, for my first year in Los Angeles, Los Angeles, everything shuts at two, and then everyone goes up to a mansion in the hills and goes to another party there, and that's where all the business deals go down, supposedly, and things. So right. I, I kind of fell into that world for a little while until I realized that it just wasn't proving as effective, and I had shit to do in the daytime. God damn it. Well, that's the thing. That's, that's one of the best cures for an addictive process is to have something better to do than to be hungover. Well, this goes back to your earlier question, actually, which is how I've changed in the past since Meaning Wave. And uh, I just don't have any room in my life or any desire for uh, anything unnecessary, which is, you know, any, I, I don't want to drink because I have this adventure. I have this really, really useful thing to do that's proving really, really useful in the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. And they tell me every day. And uh, it's amazing in my life and it's amazing in my family's life and uh you know the i, I got really annoyed not really annoyed i don't get really annoyed by social media but i did see that there was yet another vice story about having kids is awful blah, 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 blah. oh man that those that's so brutal it's so it's anti-human it's so cruel evil it is it's absolute especially evil. cruel to women i think and i had oh, some God. poor woman on my q a last week tell me that all her friends are down on her because, you know, she doesn't call herself a feminist and because she wants children. They're just torturing <laughs> her. And Jesus, it's so awful because it's like Nietzsche said, if you want to punish someone, you should punish them for their virtues. 
Yeah. And that's it's a brilliant and unbelievably cruel statement. And then to find some perfectly normal, healthy young woman who would like to have a family like every <laughs> single one of her ancestors had for 3.5 billion years and to tell her that she's responsible for, you know, elevating the carbon footprint of the planet and destroying <laughs> the ecology is just, God, it's so, it's, I just can't believe how cruel that is. And it's, and it masquerades in the guise of virtue, which makes yeah. it even worse. You know, it's like, yeah. Jesus, woman, have a child, have a husband, have a, have a career, have a life for God's sake. There's not that much to life. The me well, the meme that they're putting out there is like, you know, if you have children, like uh, it costs loads of money and you won't be able to do any of the things you enjoy and it will be life will be miserable when it's the very opposite is true. I am way more uh, financially uh, abundant or better off. I don't know if abundance is the right word yet yeah. in that direction since having a child. My life is so much better since having a child. Uh, my motivations are so much clearer. The reason for being is, is so obvious. So much joy, like un, unmeasurable levels of joy have come from that one child. And the only thing I wish with regards to my life is that if I was going to go back and have a conversation with my earlier self, is just have lots of kids as soon as possible. Right. The earlier, the better. There is no optimal time. Like Hercules wouldn't have happened if we planned it. We didn't, we didn't plan him. We always thought... Well, oh, there's no God. intelligent time to have a child. No, you're never ready. There's never enough money. There's never enough time. Da, 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 da. Uh, but it's the, it's the single most wonderful, motivating occurrence in this magical, blessed existence. Uh, yeah, well, that's how I've always felt about my kids. Yeah. You know, um, well, there's some... There's a, Variety of reasons, you know. One of the things that has to happen to you as you mature, if you mature, is that at some point you have to realize that someone is more important than you. Yeah. And I don't believe that that can happen unless you have kids because it's actually not that easy to have someone be more important than you. You know, like if you fall in love with someone, I would say there may be times when you would consider them more important than you, but I would say the general equation is something like, well, we're equally important to one another. You know, and, and if it goes past that, sometimes it gets a little bit, well, questionable, you know, like, well, I would die for you or I would do anything for you. It's like, mm, that's really? a bit much, you know, <laughs> but with kids, it's not that at all. It's like they're number one, period, and you're not. And that puts – it's a relief to some degree, I would say, but it also puts things in the proper context. And it, and it does provide you with additional impetus for proper action and ambition. Well, you and can't, there's no room for error. They're looking at you. They're, they're looking at to you for everything. You're completely responsible. Like you know, the, if you're not the best version of yourself, then what are they going to be? Yes, and and the mistakes you make are going to echo through their lives as well. And then it's intergenerational. This is the thing I realized Ooh. relatively recently. These intergenerational ills that just keep propagating down the line because they're not fixed. That yeah. And yeah, well, that's it. You know, is you get someone in some generation, they tear a hole in the fabric of reality and they pass it on to their children. And unless their children sew up that hole, then they pass it to, to their children. And mm -hmm. the, the damage remains until someone decides enough. Yeah. I'm going to repair it. And, yeah. you know, that's partly what you're trying to do as a parent is sew up the fabric of being so a child will inspire you to sew up the fabric of being like nothing else. Yes. And this is why I, I'm terrified of politicians without children, frankly, because they have no skin in the game. Or they certainly have less skin in the game than, uh, than people who have a vested interest in, in the future, not being a horrible place to live. Yes, yes, yes. Well, 
Yeah, well, I'm to, to any women or men who are listening out there that are of the proper age, I would say don't let the naysayers and the pessimists and the gloom purveyors and those who dare to compare human beings to a cancer on the face of the planet <laughs> dissuade you from having children. This is what the bad guys say in movies. That's what Agent Smith said in The Matrix. He was the villain. He was the villain. And the, uh, this ideology is the, ide the, ide the ideology of villains. It's a very, very strange thing. And, uh, you know, they believe themselves to be virtuous. And, and vir people who believe themselves to be virtuous are terrifying because they will do any kind of evil because they think they're goody-goodies. That's a terrifying thing. But as we were talking about earlier, I, I'm, I'm very excited about the future because the new generation is going to react directly against that. The most punk rock thing you can do in 2019 uh, is is get married and have a child and uh, take your life seriously and uh, be nice and be civil. God, wouldn't it be something if that was the case? That's well, quite... this, is, this is what's going to happen. I think this is what's blossoming. I think we're going to have a, a generation of, uh, of radical, wholesome Mr. Rogerses. <laughs> well, you're, I think you're the most optimistic person that I've talked to for a long time. I mean, I talked <laughs> to Steven Pinker, you know, and, and, and he's, he's optimistic in a much more detached way hmm. because he thinks that the data indicates that economically things yes. are improving you at a very rapid rate. But you're, you're speaking of something more akin to a psychological transformation. Yes, I am. I am. And, I've, and this is just based on, on observations. But I, do, I, I believe this. And there's a lot that could go wrong. We're at the best time to be alive in, the, in, the, in recorded human history, obviously. Uh, we're also at the most dangerous time because it could all collapse. Right. Everything, this wonderful miracle that we inhabit, I get to walk outside and no one throws a brick at my head. Right, <laughs> yes, which is, uh, which it's, you know, you, you, you have to be sure that one of the hallmarks of wisdom is to understand that if you could walk outside and no one throws a brick at your head, that that's actually a miracle. Yeah, it is. I know this. So, yeah, because I grew up somewhere where people, where people used to throw bricks in my head. So, um, oh, oh what, what was that all about? <laughs> no, I, just, I, um, I, I was, uh, uh, I grew up in North Wales and I was like the only person like me. I was the only person who liked music and stuff of that nature, and everyone thought I was an insane weirdo. So I was in I the of my life. And people are very brutal in, uh, in the UK, certainly compared to Los Angeles, to America, where people are very nice, compared to the brutality of that region of the world. And I think it's to do with the climate. You know, it's, it's a cold, gray rock. And the other thing, actually, is uh, in America, everyone operates under the, the, the foundational assumption that anyone could be president. So, you know, you have a service culture and waitresses are nice to you. Whereas in the UK, people operate under this assumption that there is a monarchy, which means there's a level that you could never get to or beyond, which means that there's this weird, unspoken thing that you're scum. So everyone, everyone's a bit bitter and twisted because of that, I think, in the UK. But uh, yeah, anyway, it was, I had quite a sort of tough upbringing and people were very, very mean. And I'm very, very aware of the capacity for, for nastiness in species. Uh, and horror, which, uh, so when I say things like this about where I think we're going, this isn't out of any kind of, uh, of naivety. Right, right. Of humans. I know full well what humans are capable of. And, yeah, well, that's good because optimism without the underlying wise pessimism is useless because you're not taking the, the pro seriousness of the problem with sufficient gravity because it's a serious problem. Yes, we have so, some very serious problems. <laughs> how old were you when you started associating with creative people and sort of found your own crowd? Well, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier. So when I, when I was young, I, had no, I thought I was the only person like me on Earth. I thought, you know, I was just a strange creature and I would be, that life might be this awful forever. But I sort of, you know, granted. I left, you know, I left school at 16. I left home at 16. And I uh, left... Uh, little sleepy little whales and went to a big city and that's when I started finding people like me right so them. you needed to get you needed to get out to the city yeah I had to leave home and move to a different country right yeah well and then know, I that's did that one again of the, later in life. 
Well, that's one of the issues of being high in creativity, you know, is that it's not that common and you have to find your niche. And if you live in a small place, there may not be any other people like you. And so you are going to be marked out as someone who's strange because you are strange by the dint of your creative capacity. It's virtually the defining characteristic of creativity. The thing is now you can go online and find loads of people like you. Right. And you could make and you could make art with them and you could send files backwards and forwards and you could create things and also so it's I'm interested to see what that does as well. Yeah, you well know, it certainly well, does mean that, that people of specific talents, rare talents, can find themselves in ways that they never could before. Now, it also means that people of spare and rare pathology can also find themselves and that seems to cause a certain amount of trouble but I don't see how it would be possible to get one without the other yes this well this is the thing for every one of these amazing uh, solutions we find or these wonderful gifts there's a shadow side of course we have to deal with and that's the main thing right is that we just work out how to deal with it and, and okay so it. so two more questions I guess one would be what has been the shadow side of what you've been doing? Like with working with this meaning wave, you, you, you're much more well known than you were. Has that had an effect on your life other than a positive one? And, and what's been the price that you've paid for this? You know, it hasn't been so bad so far. You know, the, the usual, some people really, really don't like you, for example. <laughs> And uh, therefore, me doing stuff with you means that suddenly I've gone from a hero in their eyes to a complete villain. And there's a few people uh, that's been the case with. But that's, you know, that's to be expected. I would say, I would say that, you know, the, ho I, the whole thing has been, has been a blessing. The whole, the whole thing has been a blessing. Uh, you know, there's the amount I'm working means I don't get to see my family as much as I would like to. There is that. Yeah. You know, I'm... I'm work you know i'm working very hard uh but the time we have together is that much more precious and we're working together very much together and we're supporting each other and and uh and you know we we, we see this as, as a an, a useful and and helpful endeavor to be engaged in and how much time are you spending working a day oh god um 14 hours or so, 15, I don't know. Like, yeah, you know, it seems like that's about the minimum amount of time that you have to work if you really want to push yourself to new levels of accomplishment. Yeah, and that's every you day. Know, yeah. Every day. Yeah, it's, it's very, very difficult to exceed expectations, let's say, if you're trying to work a normal eight-hour workday. Um, I, my, exp my experience with people is that they're either not busy enough or they're so busy they can barely keep up. And that it's usually the ones that are so busy they can barely keep up that are pushing the envelope in whatever discipline they happen to be pursuing. Yeah. And you know, then you just have to, um, this concept I heard of recently, which I like, which I've been trying to do, uh, essentialism. You know, when you, so when you get to the point where you're, which is a wonderful point to be at, where there's suddenly more to do than you have time to do with which I have fully. There are more albums I would like to make than I physically have time to do in a lifetime. There are more uh, speakers I would like to cover. There are more, you know, there's there are more, more songs I would love to play, more techniques I would love to learn. There is far more to do in this lifetime than, than I have life. So then essentialism, you boil down what are the essential things and what things cannot fit. And then you, you, know, you, then you streamline your life and you do that ever more, ever more, remove things that are less essential, making room for the more essential. And then the more you know what the more essential is, the better idea you have of where you're going and what you're trying to do and how to do it. Yeah, well, that's the separation, separation of the wheat from the chaff. That's a, real, that's a real skill if you can manage it, especially if the opportunities are flying at you fast and furiously. Well, well how do you, what do you do? You presumably have more than you could possibly hope to. Well, I do a certain amount of flailing about, I would say. <laughs> you know, um, luckily what's happened is that as I've become better known, and I think this is an element of that synchrony that you syn 
synchronism that you described earlier is that fortunately as with each leap in notoriety or popularity I've had people show up who offered to take certain tasks off my plate Mm -hmm. you know in professional relationships and um, I've been fortunate that the majority of those people have been very competent and so and I do delegate like my hiring ethos is you want this job okay do it I'm not going to micromanage you if you can do it man great right More power to you hopefully you can do it better than me and if you can't do it well then I'll have to find someone else well or we'll have to find you a different place because there's just no point in you doing it if you can't do it better than me then well then that's no good and I mean, they're, they're, I, that's the ideal thing in life is everything you're not the best at delegate that to someone who is the best at that. Right. Focus on the stuff that you're the best. Well, at. right. And then you can also continue to do more things. And, yeah. you know, I, I would say my wife and I have been fairly ruthless. Well, and my daughter as well, probably my son as well in the communication we've had about the people we've hired over the last three or four years, because the time pressure is so intense, you know, if you can do the job, man, we're thrilled to have you. But if you have three or four chances and you can't do it, then we just stop working with you immediately because we don't have any time for error. No. It's and that the, the costs of the errors are too great. So, but you can delegate. So uh, it's a difficult oh. thing to learn to do. I, I, it took me a long time to be able to let go because I did everything myself for so long. I taught myself how to do every aspect of this sort of business, from uh, graphic design to making the videos to recording to, to everything. Right. Letting go of that is, was a hard thing to learn to do. Now, now I'm very happy to do that, and if I can find someone who can do something better than, than me, then wonderful. I would much rather than that. But it did take a while. It's part of the whole ego. Well, thing. you have to also master it to some degree before you're capable of determining whether the person that you've p- pulled in as a replacement actually knows how to do it. Yeah, this is true. So there is that work that you have to do yourself before you're capable of delegating and evaluating the consequences. Okay, so last question, I think. Um, what's going to happen to you over the next year? Who knows? I'm going to work very hard. Okay. Uh, I'm going to get better. I'm going to uh, stick to the, the plan I set. And uh, the hyper productivity and uh, results of this will, will compound. So where this leads, who knows? But uh, right. I do know that I will make great music and it will be useful in a great many people's lives. Right. So you've got, a, you've got a strategy Yes. Which, uh, and what do you what do you what do you like about the hyper productivity? I mean, one of the things you said was that, well, you don't have time to drink, you don't have time to waste time, and huh. there is something really useful about hyper productivity in that regard is that it it does force you to dispense with everything that's damaging and non essential because you just yeah. don't have the time. But is there anything else about for, about the hyper productivity that you found? Um, let's say psychologically significant or useful? I'm a lot, I mean, it's, it's the thing is I started the hyper productivity thing exactly the same, same time I started uh, the carnivore diet. Mm. Um, so sometimes I'm not sure which is causing what. I used to about once a month go into a kind of deep depression for a few days, which uh, my wife would call my funk. I'm, I'm a very mm. optimistic, happy person normally, but then there would be a little bit where I was kind of the opposite. I haven't had that since. Wow, congratulations. How long has that been? That's 13 months. And what else is, I wasn't going to ask you about the diet, but now I'm going to. (laughs) What's happened to you because of the carnivore diet? Well, I lost all my unnecessary body fat. How how much was that? Um, I think I went from like 160 to 146, and I've stayed at 146 about since. And that happened pretty quickly. Like the first part of it was in days, like my face changed within a few days. You have hmm. this, this bloat, I guess. Mm-hmm. Goes. Inflammation, likely, eh? Yes, all that sort of thing. I used to have like sort of psoriasis and that went. I used to have like, my tongue was all messed up and yeah. that 
sorted itself out. You start bleeding gums and that's gone. That's uh, gone, eh? That's interesting because that that's went for me went, too. Yeah. I used to have like little bumps on my skin. You wouldn't really notice, but like close up you would. That's all gone. I have very smooth skin now. Um, I've, I have very consistent high energy. Um, I used to sort of oscillate, I guess. Um, it's made a lot of, so all, there's all those sorts of things. It's made life so much simpler and hyper productivity makes life so much simpler because when you know that certain things have to be done without question, then there's no question. Right. You know, it's like, well, I, I'm, so I can't go and do that thing because I'm going to do this. I've committed. Right. Well, that's the, that's advantage. That's the advantage of having a very well delineated aim, eh? Yes. And a higher and, and a purpose. You bet. Yes. It, it helps you separate what's necessary from what isn't necessary. And that is a genuine relief. No yeah, doubt it about it. It's, it's joyful. It's so much, it's so much weight is cast off you. There's, you know, someone asks you to do a thing. There's no debate. You either do it or you don't based on what, what this aim is, what you're doing. Right. Uh, same then applies to things like food. Like that one of the really annoying things in my life, prior to the carnival thing was like the daily what are we having for dinner conversation and the the annoyance is related to that which is completely gone i know what i'm having for dinner i'm having a steak <laughs> and, uh, and uh i know what i'm doing, having for breakfast and, and the same thing you know and i know what i'm drinking i'm drinking water and i know how i'm gonna feel you know that i know i'm not gonna suddenly be sleepy or bloated or weird after eating something you know i'm, I'm gonna be the same high energy uh purpose that's a that's creature. a major plus so congratulations on that that's a huge that's a huge beneficial transformation so let's end with this um what do you think you're doing with this what's your like i know that you have a name and, and an ambition you're making this music you're making yourself hyper productive you're concentrating on this meaning wave but yeah. underneath all that there must be a what like an invisible or an implicit ambition, something like that, a deep ambition. What what's your most profound hope for what you're engaged in? Personally, I would like to become the best version of myself possible. Um, you know, the the Dragon Ball X sort of final form type thing. The, the transformations that you go through and there's these levels of you. I want to get to the nuke level. I want to get, get to nuke level and be the best possible version of myself possible as effective on every level I can be with, and with relation to the, the path I've chosen, which is this, this music thing, um, which is what I always, what always, since I was, you know, my earliest memories is being about seven years old and, uh, listening to music and wanting to make music and, and uh, reach people. And communicate with people on that. So, and, I, I, and specifically with regard to the meaning wave. Yeah, well, I think the meaning wave thing is um, like so much we've talked about. We haven't scratched the surface of what's possible with music. We haven't scratched the surface of what it can do, and we have. I haven't scratched the surface of what I can do with it. I'm like, this is a very what we're listening to at the moment. And the level it's at right now is a, is a very Neanderthal, rough, approximate like uh, beginning of where it can go, and what it can do, I think. And I think that way, I think that way with pop music. Pop music is so new. You know, just it just happened. Boom! It was just there, and 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 uh, you know, we don't know. To, to quote you a bit, we don't know what the upper limits of this thing are. Right, so right, I'm right. excited to explore this. So I think of myself a bit like Picard in Deep Space Nine, going mm -hmm. out, adventuring into this world. Yeah, well, you've hit a vein that seems rich, and you seem highly committed to getting better and better at mining it. And so that's a good adventure. And it, I mean from what I've observed with regards to your trajectory over the last while, then um, that all seems to be expanding nicely. So it's nice to have an adventure where you, you can't necessarily see the destination, but it looks positive. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe it's not positive. You know, maybe the adventure has a horrible ending, but it's, it's an adventure. 
regardless. Yes, this uh, is true. That's that, why, that's, there's something to be said it, for that. Yeah, it's, it's an exciting. Yeah, you know, we're at this stage, as we mentioned earlier, we're at this point of human development where everything, our world, we can, we can barely imagine the world in five years, let alone 10, 15, 20. My grandmother's 96. She's the eldest of 13. Uh, she saw the birth of the radio. She was like, you know, she was, she left school at 13 to clean window. We saw TV and internet and all of this stuff appear. Like what, what are, what have we to witness? Things are that, you know, things are speeding up so radically. Uh, it's just, just an incredibly exciting, uh, time to be here and, uh, to be actively taking part in an aspect of it and sort of like, you know, marching boldly forward into unexplored territory is uh, about the best adventure I could think of. Well, look, it was really good to talk to you. I mean, I've been watching what you've been doing with a fair bit of curiosity for quite a long time because it certainly came as a shock to me when it first came out. And um, <laughs> it's, it's also refreshing to speak with someone who's unabashedly and not naively optimistic. And, um, well, A, I hope we can meet at some point in the relatively not too distant future. And B, I wish you every bit of success that you can have with your hyper productivity and your experimentation with music. And would like to thank you as well for doing what you have to popularize my, my work and my words in such a careful manner. Thank you. That's, that was my, um, yeah, I really didn't want to do disservice to those words. Um, because I respect them greatly and I'm very grateful for them and uh, I'm very grateful that you're out there doing this work and uh, you know putting your head over the, the, the battlements at this crucial crucial time in our development as, a, development as a species as we boldly march into hyperspace and our destiny so thank you very good to meet you hopefully we'll talk again in the not too distant future I'm sure we will and I hope you like the album Thank you. I'm very much looking forward to it. Nice. Okay, man. All right, wicked. Really good to meet you. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Peace. If you found this conversation engaging, you might want to pick up Dad's books, Maps of Meaning, The Architecture of Belief, or his newer best-selling 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos. Both of these books dive much deeper into the topics covered in the Jordan B. Peterson podcast. See jordanbpeterson.com for audio, ebook, and text links or pick up the books at your favorite bookseller. Next week, you'll hear my lecture from the Community Theater in Sacramento, California, recorded on June 27, 2018. I discussed the modern tendency for every domain of human experience to become defined as political, part of the political correct universe of ideas, the idea that the universities may now do more harm than good, the consequences of the revolution in communication that is being produced by online video and podcasts, and the necessity to voluntarily stress yourself, challenge yourself, to force what's best to manifest itself within you. Follow me on my YouTube channel, Jordan B. Peterson, on Twitter, at Jordan B. Peterson, on Facebook, at Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, and at Instagram, at jordan.b.peterson. Details on this show, access to my blog, information about my tour dates and other events, and my list of recommended books can be found on my website, jordanbpeterson.com.